digital strategist. I'm going to spend I'm going to spend about one minute telling you what a Dell educational strategist is because I want you to kind of have a little bit of um, background of, of why in the world <clears throat> I, I would come to a conference like this to present. Um, essentially, um, if you Google um, Dell education strategist, you'll find a little page with the eight of, the eight of me um, that exists across the US and Canada. And we are connected to parts of the US really as a bridge between Dell and the K-12 system. Um, Dell recognizes that schools are where it happens and that not all techies and not all corporations understand the unique school context. And so they've hired us to sort of be the translators. And so we get to go out and do exactly what I'm doing today, um, free of charge and work with districts um, that have worked with Dell um, as kind of a support system. Um, but really all of the people who are in my role are teachers and school administrators um, for the better part of their career. So that's what I do. And I'm not going to bore you with all these slides, but I will say that this is kind of one of my favorite things about Dell is they have one of their moonshot goals. They have five of these that are really the, the North Star for what they're trying to accomplish. And their goal basically is to um, use technology and advance health, education, and economic opportunity for a billion people by 2030. And so part of what I'm doing today is impacting, hopefully, education. Uh, it's a teeny tiny part of that moonshot goal to scale. Uh, so again, I do a lot of things, but that's not why we're here together today. Uh, the reason we're here together today is because I'm going to break down kind of these three parts of, of my thinking around becoming an indispensable librarian. I'm going to start with a little bit of perspective because I think in order to really understand what I'm talking about with that, um, we have to put our roles, regardless of what our roles are in education, but in this case in particular with librarians, into perspective. Um, and then I'm going to give you hopefully some concrete ways to increase your influence um, in your role as a librarian. I actually did this presentation with a group of um, folks out in Lubbock ISD last week, and there were people that just happened to be in the room who weren't librarians as well. And I think everybody came up to me afterward and said, that actually helped me in my role as well. And then I'm a firm believer that uh, I followed kind of, I'm a groupie of John Dewey. <laughs> I was born a little bit too late to be a true groupie of his, but one of the things he said that I love is, um, that we don't learn from the experience itself, we learn from the reflection on the experience. And so we're gonna do some reflection on what we can learn and discuss today. All right, so a little perspective. Um, I'm gonna talk about kind of how I would describe myself. And then in the chat here in just a minute, I'm gonna give you an opportunity to, to share how you would describe yourself as well. Um, I've already given you a few of these words. Um, elementary teacher, curriculum director, library coordinator, book club enthusiast. I'm in a book club with all kinds of um, librarians. I'm a wannabe librarian, I would describe myself, a book activist, an aspiring author. I do tinker um, with a blog and, and with a book that I'd like to write. And I'm also a Twitterer. I don't know how many of you are um, in the field of uh, education who love Twitter. Um, it definitely has its downsides, but especially, I think, for the role of librarian, it's a really powerful tool because so many librarians are the only ones on their campus that do what they do, and so it gives them an opportunity to um, have a PLN, a professional learning network, beyond the four walls in which they serve. So I'm going to let you guys open up the chat right now. Uh, and, and put in your name, maybe your uh, the level at which you serve, elementary, middle, high, or a role that's different as a librarian, and um, a word or two or a phrase that would describe kind of um, how you are in the space of um, education. So as we go on through, um, I want to tell you a little bit of a story about why I titled the presentation, the Indispensable Librarian. Um, one of the districts that I served in, uh, this was, gosh, about 20 years ago, but it taught me such an important lesson. And um, I was the language arts coordinator in the district at the time. And that, so the coordination of libraries kind of fell to me. Um, I guess they figured that I was the person in the room who loved books the most because of my um, coordination of, of language arts. But um, it was a district that had 13 schools and thus 13 librarians. And um, 12 of those librarians were amazing. They were, um, they were book lovers, they were book pushers, they were organized, they were um, 
enthusiasts and, and really supportive of the teachers on their campus. One of the, one of the librarians um, at one of the schools, it was an intermediate school, um, was really, really just counting the days to retirement. And she had kind of um, checked out quite a while before, um, before I got there and, and started doing anything, anything with the district. And it was frustrating and I, I could not seem to move that campus. And uh, wouldn't you know it, um, during one of the notorious rounds of budget cuts, um, her principal was on a committee with me and with the superintendent and a few others. And um, we began the, the unpleasant conversation of, of what uh, we were gonna do to solve the budget crisis of the year. There seems to be one every year, but that one was particularly bleak and we were looking at which positions um, might have to be um, condensed, condensed, combined, removed, whatever. And um, as you might imagine, this principal had not seen great value um, in the role of librarian on their campus. And he um, began sort of an active campaign to dismantle the role of librarians in that district because he had not had the experience of seeing the value add that that person or that role could play on his campus. Fortunately, um, I was on the committee too, and so I, I went toe to toe with him and, and helped him understand the uh, unusual situation at his campus compared to the others. But we were about a half an inch away from losing the role of librarian in the district because of one weak link in the chain. And it really taught me a lesson about how critically important it is um, to ensure that all librarians in a district um, reach the full potential of the, the uh, constituents uh, or the stakeholders, seeing them as a value added role. They are the teacher, the only teacher really in the school, aside from the PE art and music teachers potentially, but, but I would argue that this role is different in terms of the academic um, preparation possibilities that a librarian um, brings to the table, the only teacher in the school that sees every single student and has the potential to cultivate an academic relationship with every single student on the campus. And so um, when, when cased that way, uh, to me, the role of librarian is, is really one of the top three-ish um, most important roles on the campus, but I don't necessarily always see librarians positioned that way as key instructional leaders. Um, that are in close contact with their principals. So I'm kind of on a, on a bit of a crusade to help change that. And that's gonna be one of the things we work on together today. So I am going to do my very best to get this um, YouTube clip to work. Um, but I want to begin um, with this, um, this a little video clip from YouTube um, from the book Zoom. Uh, it is one, it, whoops, Let's see if I can get it to, to work for us. There we go. Um, Istvan Banye, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, wrote this book. And um, hopefully you'll enjoy this little clip. Can you hear it? Thumbs up if you can hear it. If not, it's actually still just as meaningful. I'm just going to play about one minute of it. I see somebody put in there no sound. It's actually the only sound. This is a wordless picture book. And so the only sound playing are barnyard animals. So I'm gonna go ahead and let it keep playing and we'll, we'll let the, the, the focus be on the illustrations. All right, so I'm gonna stop it right there. You see what's been happening. It started with the, the rooster um, and then it zoomed out to the barnyard and then it zoomed out to the children. And the thing I love about this book is it actually, I, I, it comes to mind sometimes when I'm in a situation when I'm so close to the trees that I fail to notice the forest. And, um, and, and I have to keep remembering to zoom out, to think about um, the, the role that I'm playing and what my why is in that role. And I'm gonna ask you to focus on, we've already kind of done a little bit of this in the introductions earlier, but how would you describe the librarian's job 
if you were talking with a person who'd never had a school librarian before, um, how would you describe the, the role of the librarian? I would encourage you to come off of mute or put in the chat um, kind of the why, the, the purpose of the role of the librarian um, from your experience. Promote the joy of reading, advocate for time spent holding books. Excellent. I spent a little bit too much time holding a book last night. I could not put a book down and it, it, it's what I did until about 1230 last night. <laughs> Librarians would be proud. All right, somebody else. Oh, I love that. The role of the school librarian should be the central command for the campus. They have a sense of the culture and climate of the campus and can also bridge between recreational and academic reading. That right there should be like the, the headline or, or maybe the byline of every librarian's uh, role. That's awesome. Central command for the campus. And I think I love what you said about the culture and the climate. I became really hooked on the role of librarian through an experience similar to that um, when I was teaching first grade in an elementary school forever ago, about 25 years ago. Um, our school librarian um, always had in her office a fresh coffee pot of coffee brewing for the teachers to come in. Um, and that didn't necessarily directly benefit the students, obviously, although her library was very student friendly as well. But it made the library a safe and, and really nurturing place for the, the teachers to come in and have um, academically focused conversations and just feel comfortable. It was like the family room of the school. And that really is, has been sort of the image that stayed in my mind forever about how the library can have that impact on a campus. The heart of the school, for sure. All right, so one of the things that I want to draw your attention to is the, what I'm gonna call the proverbial elephant in the middle of the room, especially with the pandemic. Um, one of the things that I know a lot of the librarians within my sphere have had to become is really a jack of all trades. They've become the device managers, they've become the, the help desk, they've become the babysitters <laughs> in some cases, they've become the default class coverers during the pandemic and, and many, many other things. And so. Um, I, I'm sure you could tell me stories that, that would really just bring me sadness because they, they are so far beyond and outside of the realm of what the quote unquote normal role of the librarian could be. Um, but I also understand that the more indispensable you are to your campus, regardless of what other duties as assigned, you, um, you get um, passed along, the um, more valuable you are. Although I want to make sure that you don't hear me say that you don't want to, I want to make sure we, that you do hear me say that we still, it's so important to stay true to the mission. So the book I'm going to cite and kind of bring to your attention, hopefully for the more than the second time, this is a book that's been around forever and the seven habits of highly effective people. I go back to those. Actually, I read this book 25, 30 years ago. And I sometimes still go back to them because they're so timeless in their nature. And so to, to try to tackle that elephant in the room of, I don't get to do what I signed up to do. Um, I really have a hard time getting to do the role of the librarian. I'm gonna ask you to think about a couple of things. I'm gonna ask you to think about the circle of concern that you have. And you can actually draw this out. Um, if you have pen and paper handy, this is an exercise that I think would be worth spending a moment or two doing because it's gonna serve as sort of a foundation for some of the things we talk about later in the session. Circle of concern, right? Like I have to cover classes. I don't have an aid. I don't have any parent volunteers. I don't have a budget. I, 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 I right? For all the different things that can cause um, librarians here to turn gray prematurely, right? And then within all of the things that we have to contend with, we also have another circle and that is our circle of influence. And that is the, the set of things that we do we may be concerned about, but that we can influence. So for example, um, I don't have the opportunity to see all of my students every week, but how can I influence? That is something I could technically influence by some creative scheduling or some creative lobbying or something like that, right? Things that I can influence. I don't have a lot of uh, space in my library. Well, how can I solve that problem? Maybe I could invite a committee of students in, a committee of teachers in to help me rethink the layout of my 
that space, whatever it is, I may be reaching there a little bit, but there are some things within our sphere that we can influence. And the research has said that when we focus um, mo most of our <laughs> waking mental energy on the circle of concern, that is when we, we get burnt out really quickly. We feel ineffective, we feel shut down, we start to um, let negative talk um, exceed the ratio of positive talk in our roles. And we really don't draw people towards us because we're always focused on the circle of concern versus the circle of influence. On the other hand, when we focus on the circle of influence, it grows, right? There may be some things within our circle of concern that are never gonna be eclipsed by the circle of influence. But the more we focus on the things we can influence, the more that grows and we're able to tackle some of the bigger and bigger concerns that existed before because we have some momentum and we have a track record and we have maybe even more advocates on our side. So as we think about um, the indispensability of a librarian, um, think about how much time you spend mentally worrying about or concerned with each of those two spheres. All right. Um, I'm going to stop for just a minute and I'm going to ask either in the chat or aloud, unmuted, um, that you kind of call out to me some of the things that could be in the circle of concern or in the circle of influence um, based on the experiences you have had in your role. And if you're not a librarian, you can still throw out some of those that can relate to your role or they can relate to um, the role you know that librarians play on campuses. So I'll pause here for just a minute. What are some things that could, you can just, if you're going to put it in the chat, just put concern dash and then the thing or influence dash and then the thing. Thank you, Kim, for bringing that forward as a concern. Teaching resource, research skills and citation skills, something that we can influence, access to books and exposure to new titles and authors, absolutely. And influence a love of reading, so true. Keep going. Concerned about kids reading, loving it, and having opportunities, right? And so I want to I want to challenge you um, that if there are things that are within your circle of concern and you're not quite sure how they can become in your sphere of influence, um, I would either let them go, or if letting them go, for example, research um, and citations is, is something you really can't let go, how can we move it into that sphere of influence, um, potentially by enlisting certain teachers within the campus to help, or enlisting, um, maybe starting with the, um, the notion of, students researching something that might be a little bit less um, school worthy, <laughs> TikTok videos, other such things um, than we would prefer, uh, but that's still uh, a starting point or an on ramp to the research we want to teach them. Yeah, I see some things about censorship and diversity of authors and topics. Absolutely. Um, talk about the most challenging thing about being a librarian, I would say, probably over the course of the last 24 months has been some of the politics in the state of Texas in particular. Right. I actually have a strategy that I'm going to share here in just a minute that I think might, might, might help, help um, you get a leg up on that to be able to influence it a bit. We, it actually worked for us in Austin, so maybe that can shed some light. All right. So here's what we're going to we're going to shift gears here into the things that we can influence. Um, so this is going to be an exercise. I really do want you to um, practice this. In, if you're in a situation, um, grab a piece of paper or even do a makeshift version of this on a sticky note on your computer if you don't have a piece of paper with you. Um, but we're going to draw a sphere, um, a circle here um, and, and put the word librarian in the middle of it. Please do not put the little dots with the names that correspond to them um, yet, but you're going to have a circle with the word librarian in the middle. And um, I'm going to make reference to Brene Brown's newest book, um, Atlas of the Heart, which to me is kind of like a compendium of emotional intelligence. Um, and the focus of this, because it will definitely grow your influence, 
um, is about relationships. And she says, I define connection as the energy that exists between people when they feel seen, heard, and valued. valued. When they can give and receive without judgment and when they derive sustenance and strength from the relationship. And one of the things that is pretty universally understood is that the more, um, the closer we feel to somebody in relationship, um, the more comfortable, more trusting, the more frequent potentially um, that relationship will get attention. And if we're trying to increase our influence as librarians, one of the things we also have to influence is sort of our relational capital within our school or our district. So at around the edge of the circle that you've drawn, I want you to put some dots and next to each dot, I want you to put the name of a person um, who you um, can or should interact with in order to do your job well as a librarian. So you can see, for instance, in my elementary sphere, I might have the third grade team of teachers, the kindergarten team of teachers, the PTA president, assistant principal, um, the, um, what does that bottom one say? My thing is covering it up. Um, the uh, instructional technology director, a curriculum coordinator, a principal, counselor, whomever it is. Um, I want you to put a dot and in your circle should look different than mine. Some of you might have the superintendent in your, in your sphere. Some of you might have um, a parent advocacy group um, that's other than the PTA. So I'm gonna pause for just a minute. I want you to think about the dots that should be around your circle and the um, names or titles or roles that correspond with those. Give you about 30 more seconds to finish that up. Think outside of the box. Think about maybe the, the public librarian in your community. Maybe think about the feeder campus librarian. Um, basically, the people that can help you get what you want and do what you want in your world with librarian. All right. So I'm going to pause here and I'm going to ask you for each of the roles, for example, you're going to draw a line between the word librarian and the role. So for example, if I know, and, and I'm going to give you like a six month window of time between January and now, um, if I know that in my role as librarian, I had two interactions with the English language arts and reading coordinator for the district, um, I'm going to draw two lines between the librarian and the ELAR coordinator. If I know that I met with my principal only really three times during the year, which hopefully is not the case, but it could be. Um, I'm going to draw three lines between the principal and the librarian. If I met with the fifth grade team, because those were my people, they were the biggest like book friendly people on the campus, and I met with them um, like every day, I'm going to draw dozens of lines, and that's going to look darker between the fifth grade and the librarian. Counselor, maybe only once a month, whatever. I'm just inventing this right now. Um, you get the idea. I'm going to pause and let you um, distribute the frequency of those interactions um, around the circle. So you're going to have sort of a visual depiction of the relationships that um, got frequent attention and the visual depiction of the relationships that got very little attention. All right. As you've gone around the circle there, um, I would be curious to know what some of the observations are that, um, that you're having about people who have the ability to influence the library, such as a curriculum coordinator, a library director, a superintendent, a PTA president, a principal, whomever, um, and the frequency of interactions that you have had with those people. I would love for you to observe that either in the chat or to go off of mute and to share that. Talk with teachers a lot, right? But a lot of times we, we don't think as much about district personnel unless there's a problem, right? And sometimes if we only interact with people when there's a problem, um, we end up um, with a relationship that might be strained or um, not quite as easy to leverage as we'd hoped. I'm 
kind of jump to this next slide. This, speaking of being, um, have it, being able to um, leverage relationships, um, you can see that there is um, a tiny URL at the bottom. Um, I'm gonna, I can share with you the link to these slides later, but this, there were a few ideas that I wanted to share during this expand your influence time that I wanted to make sure that you were clearly aware of um, and didn't miss. And this is one of the things we did when I was in Austin ISD. And that was, um, we, we read this blog um, about being a proactive librarian. Um, and book challenges have definitely been the name of the game lately, whether they're actually filed as a challenge or if it's just in the media. Um, and one of the things we did is it was optional for librarians, but many, many of them did it and everyone who did it was glad that they had, is they actually formed a, um, an advisory, a library advisory committee with some key stakeholders in the school. You know, we do that if we get a book challenge, but we, um, we decided to take it to a different stance and we formed a committee at the beginning of the year that um, had some parents, some students, some teachers, an administrator on it. And often it was people who, who were interested in books who like to read whatever the criteria, I would recommend you making sure that the committee has some diversity um, on it. Um, however, you wanted to find diversity in that regard. Um, but that committee um, spent some time with our librarians looking at selection policies, looking at the choices that the librarians had with their budgets and really weighing in from the get-go on the choices that were made or the dilemmas that a librarian had so that they became a team so that when, not if these days, when book challenges came, the librarian would be able to show the documentation of the proactive work that this committee had done together to make decisions for the school. And in that regard, it wasn't all resting on the shoulders of the librarian. And there was a team of people to defend the decision if a defending of the decision had to be made. And then the, the book challenge um, experiences we had after that were far less um, daunting. Uh, because it was really a conversation with the committee that had helped with the selection of materials in the first place. So I'm going to run through a few different strategies that I think are high impact right now that might um, help you to expand your sphere of influence. Um, this is one of them. Um, the other thing is um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, social media. Um, sometimes people really just like kind of break out in hives when I talk about the opportunity to learn on Twitter or learn about uh, the librarians of TikTok or, or even dabble in podcasts, they think they don't have time or that it's a waste. I would encourage you to rethink those notions if, if those are yours, um, because those who feed others must first be fed. We can't be good teachers um, and or good school leaders within our role of a librarian unless we have been fed by or um, grown through our experiences learning from others. So I'm personally not a big TikToker, but um, I have learned about librarians of TikTok um, from this uh, podcast I've been listening to like crazy by Amy Herman. And if you haven't discovered her podcast yet, I would highly recommend that you do. You can tell by the numbers on the little um, screenshot I did, there's a couple hundred episodes at this point. Um, and the topics um, definitely range um, widely, but um, that uh, experience listening to a lot of her podcasts, and in fact, one of the ideas that you're going to get, a couple of them actually came from that podcast, um, taught me about the glory of librarians, on librarians of TikTok. Same thing with Twitter. Twitter is a great place um, to find a PLN um, for librarians or frankly for any other role in education, and rather than giving you a, a pre-curated list of Twitter handles to follow. Um, I, I'm gonna leave that up to you because librarians are good researchers. And so I'm not gonna try to bias you with some of mine, but um, definitely don't underestimate the importance of finding a PLN and letting it feed you. Um, this was actually um, from one of the um, Amy Herman podcasts. It was when she had um, Lucas Maxwell, who was I think the teacher of the year, sorry, the librarian of the year for all of the United Kingdom. Um, a couple of years ago, um, it was from episode 132, Raising the Profile of the Librarian in the Library. Um, and you can see his Twitter handle there. 
but he had a collection of, I think it was 14 strategies um, where he described how he um, grew his influence across his campus to the point where people like the library was the most popular place on the campus and he had influence far beyond the scope of what you would consider to be his normal responsibilities. He put himself in some uncomfortable positions he described as kind of becoming the annual speaker at the all school assembly kickoff and things like that. Um, but he, some of you probably do a lot of these things. Um, he advertised in the staff lounge and on the, on the bathroom stalls and at the water fountains and other places. Um, where there was just always a presence of what he was reading um, or what he would he was pushing or things like that. Um, I'm going to talk about surprise center reads here in just a minute because I think that was one of my favorite um, resource resource ideas from him. Um, but I, I, as I thought about his his approach, I thought about what my dad always said: "You're either part of the problem or you're part of the solution." And to me, the way in which he creatively reached those on his campus. Um, showed me that he was definitely part of the solution. All right, so surprise summer reads. This is an idea that came from him. And you can see that, um, you can see the tinyurl.com uh, uh, little condensed uh, URL that I created for you um, at the bottom if you wanna find this on your own. But essentially, um, the concept is simple. Um, staff tell me, this is what he says, staff tell me the kinds of books, authors, and genres that they typically enjoy. Then we find a book from our shelves, wrap it up, and present it to them before the end of the school year. Um, in order to do this, I go back to that relationship wheel. You have to have a bit of a relationship, or it's ideal if you do have a relationship with folks to know a little bit about their personality and to know kind of what their quirks are and what their interests are and that sort of thing. And I love the idea of wrapping this up with a, in brown paper with a surprise um, tag on it, um, personalized for each person according to their needs or interests. And the goal is for them to take it in the summertime, write a short review of it in September, and then that becomes the book display that everybody looks forward to when folks come back in the fall. Um, so it's, it's definitely solving multiple problems. It's, it's giving folks something to read and keep their brain uh, active with during the summer. It's a relationship building tool. And it's also a tool to help your fall book display generate some interest across the staff. So I thought that was a, a really cool idea to become indispensable. All right, and here is this part. We do not learn from experience, but we learn from reflecting on experience. So it's um, about 10 after 11 right now. We have about five more minutes in the session. And I really just wanted you to pause for a second and think about um, three things that you'll review or research further based on what you've heard today. Two things in which you'll intentionally increase your relational wheel connections. And one thing you'll definitely take with you from today. So I'm gonna pause there and let you either um, unmute and speak it out loud or um, share one of your three, two, one things um, in the chat. Let me librarians of TikTok, yay. Good job. That's awesome. I think more than ever before, um, our, our profession, particularly the profession of librarianship, is just under attack politically. And um, finding and nurturing yourself through a PRN, PLN, sorry, um, is more important than it's ever been before. Take that away. What else? Advocating with school leaders, district leaders, parent leaders. Yay, Amy Herman's podcast. That's awesome. And she's actually pretty active on Twitter too. I've interacted with her a little bit on Twitter um, and it's been fun to get to know her that way. Thank you for the sign in form. Other ideas you're going to take with you, things that you're reflecting on. I would love to interact with you on Twitter as well. I'm at Newell, E-D-U, N-E-W-E-L-L, E-D-U. 
Um, and I don't know if I mentioned this before, I keep my personal and my professional Twitter um, as separate as possible. Um, I sometimes the two intersect when, when there are uh, school tragedies or, or things that, that borderline on both. But, but generally speaking, um, that's where, what you'll find on my professional Twitter blogs that I found, um, people that I've found that I've learned from, uh, interesting little nuggets. Um, also within my sphere um, at, at Dell, I'm learning so much um, about esports and about girls who game and about cybersecurity and all kinds of fun things. I'd be happy to talk with you all about as well. But again, curriculum instruction and, and library and work and, and reading is, is my first love. So I'm gonna thank you for joining us today. I hope you um, are walking away with a, at least a couple of nuggets that you didn't have when you walked in. I hope, um, well, I don't hope, I implore you to take um, a few minutes this summer and just completely decompress from probably the hardest school year in the history of school years. And I just wanna thank you for the work that you do. I'm inspired by you. Thank you so much for your time, Susanna. We really appreciate it. It's an outstanding presentation. Uh, well, I feel there's a lot of value to everything that you covered today. And I would like to remind everyone uh, before exiting out of the Zoom session to go ahead and click on that linked uh, form there that it's on the chat. I want to go ahead and place it again uh, so that you can receive credit for your attendance and time today. And, and again, it's been a pleasure uh, you know, having you, um, you know, today with us, Susanna. We greatly appreciate it. Thank you, everyone in attendance for taking the time and joining us as well.